approves the rule. Chapter 5 The Short Seller, He of the Black Heart I recall reading a novel about a rich man who was, in everything, vicious and hateful. Among his other evil attributes, the author described how he had made his first fortune. He had sold stock short during a great panic, and had thus enriched himself fabulously, while hundreds of thousands were being plunged into poverty and ruin. This quotation expresses well enough the vague, universal indignation at the short seller. This indignation only exists during and after panics. During prosperous times he receives about as much attention as do people who practice barratry. Before October 1929, no one objected to short sellers except their own families. The families objected to going bankrupt. Vague as the general feeling is, two of its implications are quite clear. One is that being a bear raider is something like being a usurer or a jewel thief. That it is an easy way to pick up a fortune provided you are willing to be immoral. The second is that it is socially harmful. Before examining these two claims, I must touch on the ancient human tendency to personify general misfortune in some human shape. While hundreds of thousands are being plunged into poverty, only the thoughtful ask, What is happening to us? The popular cry is, Who is doing this to us? And its satisfying sequel, Just let me get my hands on him. The public goes raging about like an infuriated mob with a rope. Equally, they resemble the ancient boatload of superstitious sailors looking for a Jonah to fling overboard, or a Salem town meeting deciding who was the witch that caused the cow to die. An injured party cannot get his hands on unsound credit inflation or the law of gravity. It is much more satisfactory, for instance, to get Mr. J.P. Morgan, the perfect personification of wealth, down to Washington to be asked by men of moderate means a lot of questions he can't satisfactorily answer. However, Mr. Morgan and the great bankers are not quite the perfect scapegoats. After all, it requires some mental strain to connect up their unwise or allegedly criminal activities with our own plight. They may have played ducks and drakes with the national credit, and everybody knows what that is, even if he can't quite explain it. Or maybe it was something else they did, which was even worse and even harder to understand. Our own personal plight, however, is crystal clear. We are long, on margin, several hundred shares of radio, and the margin is disappearing. We originally got the tip from our brother-in-law, and he got it from a very big man whom he met at a clam bake. That man, big as he was, was not nearly so big as Mr. Morgan, and had not ever met him or any other robber baron either. But how about those short-selling fellows? Now we are getting close to home. At the very moment when we were buying that stock, hopefully and constructively, looking forward and upward toward better things, those fellows, men without bowels, were selling it and they didn't even have it to sell. They were looking downward and for worse things. They thought it would go down, and they helped it to go down. How unnatural, how perverse, how cynical. Why should society tolerate such men any more than those who burn down houses for the insurance? For the defense. I have stated the case against the short seller as passionately as I know how, because that is the proper and the only way to state it. The case consists 100% of passion. The old line Wall Streeters have always defended the short sellers with an intricate oration about the short seller's economic and even social function. According to them, his presence makes markets closer and steadier, and he cushions the shock of violent declines. He begins to sound like a kind-hearted lady carrying baskets of goodies to the poor. He is a bear and is supposed to make a good living, and at the same time he fulfills a function that helps the bulls, who outnumber him a hundred to one and who are his opponents, to make a good living. 
It is a fine example of the Pollyanna double-talk, which is the common tongue of brokerage houses. A bear no doubt does help to make the market somewhat closer. A close market is one where both buyers and sellers are able to trade at close to the same price. To hear Wall Street traders tell about it, one might conclude that close markets are one of mankind's most precious blessings. It is a little hard to prove how much closer the bears cause the markets to become, because the bears rarely enter any market that isn't pretty close and active to begin with. To sell short in a wide market is to risk selling into a bag, and if you do that, you will probably take a terrible bath, as the boys say. During a decline, the presence of a short interest undeniably cushions the shock to some extent, but not enough to call itself much of a factor in the general welfare. Mr. Justice Holmes once defended short selling more philosophically. Of course, in a modern market, contracts are not confined to sales for immediate delivery. People will endeavor to forecast the future and to make agreements according to their prophecy. Speculation of this kind by competent men is the self-adjustment of society to the probable. This case had nothing to do with the short selling of grain, not stocks, so the citation is tossed in here more for its eloquence than its relevance. A DIFFERENT DEFENSE For a number of years now there has been, in the making, a careful tabulation of the short interest on the New York Stock Exchange. It shows how much the bears sold and how much they covered week by week, good weeks and bad. An examination of these figures, they are available to everyone, seems to the writer to reveal the following unexciting facts. These facts, in turn, are all the defense the short sellers really need. The first and most important point, which is a complete defense in itself, but hard on the short seller's ego, is that their influence is slight. For many technical reasons, their precise mathematical participation in the market cannot be stated with any fairness, but it is small. I should say that their influence, for both good and evil, is a little more than a drop in the bucket and something less than a hill of beans. This should not be surprising news. The only short sellers worthy of the name come from the ranks of that numerically small class, professional traders, and only a few of them are convinced bears. This occupation, while not evil, is indeed perverse and unnatural. Profound psychological forces always have to be overcome to sell a stock short. Occasionally, a customer is persuaded to try his hand at it. Immediately he makes his sale, he becomes acutely wretched, and he stays that way until he is covered, whether at a profit or a loss. For some subtle reason, the idea that he owes someone some stock he hasn't got is insupportable. What he is accustomed to, quite as a matter of course, is owing someone some money he hasn't got. In comparison, this condition scarcely worries him at all. When he buys a stock, borrowing money casually from the broker to do it, and the stock goes down five points, he is comparatively calm. But when he sells it short, and it goes up three quarters, he is immediately desperate. He thinks it might go to a thousand, although precious few stocks ever have. When he buys it, he never considers that it might go to zero, though that is the precise figure where a great many common stocks eventually wind up. Added to everything else when he is short is a dim, unwarranted feeling that maybe he is going to be arrested by the police. I suggest that one cause of this feeling is the deathlessness of that classic couplet, He who sells what isn't hisn must buy it back or go to prison. The above, which is not particularly good doggerel nor particularly correct, has persisted since the days of Uncle Daniel Drew. No speculator who hears it is ever able to forget it. Some poet should arise who would sing a convincing warning on the other side. How would this be? He who buys what he can't pay for is not the man to shout hooray for. This rhymes, and it is accurate. But as a terrifying couplet, it doesn't seem to be so good. With and Without Bears
Perhaps the chief ideal of those who oppose allowing short selling is that markets shall not break downwards with violence. That this ideal shall ever be attained is as doubtful as that violent tragedy shall ever be eliminated from life itself. What is demonstrable is that the elimination of short selling certainly won't prevent these catastrophes at all. This demonstration is empirical. One needs only a glance at markets where short selling is either forbidden, impossible, hampered, or allowed, and compare what happens. One, dictatorships always immediately ban short selling, since it is axiomatic with them that no professional pessimists are going to be tolerated. Now, whatever the reader may think of totalitarian philosophy in general, I do not think he will envy them for their condition of their security markets. Two, there has never been any short selling whatever in real estate, that great investment medium, for the reason that it is impossible to borrow it for future delivery. But what of the stability in markets in speculative real estate? Prices frequently go away up, and then, when this movement is terminated, they go away down. In fact, it might be better pictured by saying that prices, after a real estate boom, don't go down at all. They just seem to evaporate. Such commodities as wheat or copper or pepper can be sold short, and customarily are. Their prices, too, break far down when a boom collapses. There is no honest way to compare these declines statistically, but I think it is observable that the declines in commodities are less disorderly than in speculative real estate. 3. Right on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, most everything that has to do with this controversy has been given a thorough tryout. Before 1933, short sellers could do what they pleased. Under that system, we had ill-advised booms and murderous panics, besides other periods when nothing spectacular happened. Since that date, short sellers have been so restricted in their activities that your maiden aunt couldn't really complain of their sins. The resulting phenomena have been precisely the same, save that the dull stretches are more in evidence. The dull stretches do not seem to add any useful contribution to the national economy. 4. At any period, it is easy to compare the actions of stocks which have a short interest with those that haven't. In both cases, choose a stock with a respectable corporate history behind it. Inactive listed stocks have virtually no short interest, and the same is true for many important issues traded over the counter. In the case of a general market break, what happens? Let us call the well-known, continuously traded stock, which has a short interest, American Popularity of Delaware. It is affectionately called POP by the boys in the boardroom. The other stock of comparable rating, in which transactions are rare, is United Chamber of Music. No one dares to be short as much as a hundred shares of chamber music, because no seller may turn up for a week, nor a buyer either. Both stocks are quoted at 75. That is to say, popularity is actually selling there. The last sale of music took place at 75 day before yesterday. It is now quoted, bid and asked, 75 to 80. Now comes the general market break. Its causes will be crystal clear only after the storm. Anyway, the ticker starts to chatter like a terrified gibbon. American popularity starts downward with the promptness of a runner leaving his mark. It sells down to 70 and then gallantly rallies a bit, having ticked at most of the intermediate eighths. Chamber music, imperturbable as a bump on a log, remains quoted 75 to 80. There is an hour's lull. Then all hell breaks loose and the market falls out of bed. Pop, still playing most of the grace notes down the scale, breaks through 70 without even pausing to wave a hand at the stunned onlookers and continues toward the base clef. Finally, news of the disaster gets into an uptown club, and a couple of holders of music decide it might be a good thing to sell. They get a quote with some difficulty. It is 60 to 75. Since they are unwilling to sell at 60, there is still no visible action in music, save for the altered and unsatisfactory quotation. Now, two or three weeks later, when the firing has ceased and the market has leveled out, it is likely you will find both stocks quietly selling at 55. 
In this case, our sympathy goes to the holders of music, who had such scant chances of selling. However, it is equally likely that the downward movement ceased after three days, and that three weeks later, both stocks were again quietly at 75. In this case, our sympathy should be extended to many quantum holders of pop. For three days they watched it tick away, the eighths and quarters, with the fascinated gaze of a bird hypnotized by a snake. At sixty-four and three-quarters with muttered curses from ashen lips, they took advantage of the famed marketability of American popularity of Delaware and sold it out. Bear Rating I have purposefully left for last the awful subject of bear rating. In all discussions of short selling that are meant for public consumption, everyone, whether pro or con, agrees that bear rating is outside the pale of decent human activity. Whether they are all sincere in their sweeping condemnation, I have no way of knowing. Bear rating is the further ruthless slaughtering of prices by selling short at a time when they are already cruelly disorganized by actual economic calamity. That is rating at what is considered its worst. Other operations of the rater are somewhat more technical and less spectacular. One is the effort to depress a certain stock a few points in the hope of touching off some stop-loss orders. If this is accomplished, the stock would sell yet lower, at least briefly, which gives the raider a chance for profit. Even if no stop-loss orders are uncovered, the sight of declining prices on the ticker tape usually frightens some holders into selling. That, at least, is the bear's hypothesis. A more extensive operation, looking for a larger profit, is to help depress stocks to the point where margin calls will be sent out. Since many of these calls will not be answered, the stocks, some 24 hours later, should have another sharp sinking spell. This phenomenon is so demonstrable that possibly the word theory may be used in this connection. So widespread is the condemnation of these practices at this time that one hesitates to say anything in extenuation, just as one might hesitate to say anything in favor of robbing graves. However, I will put on a bulletproof vest and mumble the following few comments. First, it should not be forgotten that bear rating is no easy business, whatever you may think of its ethics. In the long run, it is successful about as often as it isn't. It is just when markets are at their hopeless nadir that they sometimes flash back and reach for the stars. When that happens, a small group of these pessimistic villains is suddenly engulfed and ruined. There is, of course, no congressional investigation to find out who did that to them. No single eye is wet for them. If you still think it is an easy way to make money, get yourself a large stake and come down and try it. If you make a fortune, you can square it with yourself by giving half your profits to the poor. Far more important than that is this question. Who suffers when the triumphant bears further push down the prices of stocks? Who loses money because of them? The answer is the people who have bought stocks on margin looking for a rise. They are the people who can be sold out when their margin is gone. They are the only people who put in stop-loss orders. They hoped for a large profit. Surely they must realize that they may sustain a large loss. The bears feel that way about it when they make their gloomy commitments. A man who borrows money to buy a common stock has no right to think of himself as a constructive social benefactor. He is just another fellow trying to be smart or lucky or both. Those who have hopes of living by the sword should not make too loud a fuss when they perish by the sword. What then shall we say of the bona fide investor whose holdings are depreciated by the short selling? I do not believe that the investor's holdings are hurt by anything the raider does. When the raider has finished his activities, there has been a sale and also a purchase because he has to buy back every share he sells. Why is that any more harmful to the investor than first a purchase, then a sale? A bona fide investor, the widow Perkins, owns and has owned for a considerable time 50 General Motors and 15 American Telephone. 
when the Bear Raiders, assisted by fate, or fate assisted by the Bear Raiders, step in and knock these securities down a dozen points in a couple of weeks, the Widow Perkins does not rush downtown and sell them out. She probably didn't even hear about the catastrophe, which is just as well. The Bears may be able to help depress the market price of a stock. It is not they who cut the dividends. And then suppose the widow also owns a couple of inactive or unlisted stocks, which no one remotely considers rating, say 10 Vulcan Detinning, 10 Alabama Great Southern Ordinary, and 2 First National Bank of New York. Well, when the smoke of battle has cleared away, these three stocks will no doubt be found to have declined, proportionately, not much less or much more than the two that the bears operated in. For those readers who are boiling with rage at these remarks about bear rating, it is time to say that I was really only spoofing. The whole subject is academic, because for several years now, the New York Stock Exchange has, by definite rules, made bear rating impossible. You yourself have seen the wonderful results of this legislation. That is, you have seen them if you have a more powerful microscope than I have. Chapter 6 Puts, Calls, Straddles, and Gabble In a recondite corner of Wall Street, business is done in options, or papers, as they are colloquially called. The business is not large or of great importance, but it is interesting in some of its aspects. Whether or not the option brokers fill a crying economic need is debatable, but at least they work and worry plenty. The common occupational diseases of this industry are gray hairs and laryngitis. In no other offices does such a complex numerical gabble-gabble go on. This rapid babble is inherent in the option business. In an ordinary stock transaction, one party gives a market indicating the limits at which he is willing to do business. The other party usually counters with an indication of whether he wishes to buy or sell and with how much stock and at what price he will do business. But nothing so simple as this can occur in a trade in options. The above negotiations in an option trade merely constitute a brief introduction to the transaction, and after that six or seven other matters have to be bargained about. Since the conception of stock options originated abroad, where they are still much more important than they are here, much of this rapid gabble-gabble is conducted in accents, strongly tinged with Polish, Dutch, German, French, and Bronx. When the option trader is not engaged in the gabble-gabble of trading on the telephones, he is out getting customers. This means pointing out to possible buyers of options that they are a splendid thing to buy and pointing out to possible sellers that they are a splendid thing to sell. I have even heard them when they are excited, and excitement is the normal state of mind of an option broker even when he is home eating his supper, present both viewpoints in the same session. They believe implicitly in this paradox, which is the backbone of their business. Thus the buyer does well, the seller does well, and it is not necessary to stress the point that the broker does well enough. Many examples can be cited showing all three of them emerging from their adventures with a profit. One wonders why the problem of unemployment cannot be solved by having the unemployed buy and sell each other options, instead of mooning around on those park benches. What Options Are more or less. Those who already have clearly in mind what are the mechanics of options may profitably skip this section. All others, by making a careful study of what follows, should be able to glean a certain amount of confusion from it. The subject, like Pinochle, is not profound, but it is complex. If you really want to learn about options, you must take a little money and buy one. At the end of 30 or 90 days, no matter what else happens, you will have a clearer idea of its multiple possibilities than you can get here. There are three kinds of options, calls, puts, and straddles. To try to describe them in general terms, 
is like describing a spiraled staircase without using gestures. Let us get down to cases and illustrate with a fairly typical transaction. The buying of a certain call. No case can be truly typical. The variations are infinite. Suppose you get a hot tip that a certain stock, selling at 50, is going to have a sharp rise, and you make up your mind to speculate in it to the extent of 100 shares. The usual procedure is to procure $3,000 or more, buy the stock on margin, and pray for it to go up. If it does not go up but down, it is quite conceivable that you will lose all or much of your $3,000. But suppose instead of doing this, you ask your broker to quote the market in calls on this stock. It turns out that for a mere $137.50, you can buy a call, good for 30 days, at 52 and three quarters. This seems just too good to be true. It really isn't. So you do it. How are you fixed now? The great point is that no matter how disappointingly the stock acts, even if it sells down to zero, all you stand to lose is $137.50, which is a far cry from $3,000. If it goes up, you may demand from the broker 100 shares any time in the next 30 days at 52 and three quarters. Then you sell the 100 shares out on the stock exchange at the higher price, and the difference is yours, all yours, except for the commissions, plus the $137.50 that you have already paid, and a few details. After that, all you have to decide is whether you should go to Florida or pay for your brother-in-law's appendicitis. Puts are the opposite of calls. When you buy them, you make your profit if the stock goes sharply down. Your loss is similarly limited to the price of the option, which is frequently $137.50. Straddles are a put and a call bought together. They cost you more, but when you have a straddle, you don't care whether the stock goes up or down so long as it goes somewhere. It must, of course, move fairly sharply and within the time limit for you to profit. I have been describing what are known as 30-day options for regular money, which means $137.50. At least equally recommended are 90-day options at the market. Under this arrangement, you might have to pay, say, $550 for a call, good for three months. During this period, you could at any time demand from the broker 100 shares of the stock at the market, in this case, 50 you would begin to see a profit as the stock passed a price of about 56. This type of option is supposed to be an even happier medium for making money than the regular money kind. It is a controversy that I should not care to dip into. I have not begun to touch upon all the fascinating opportunities for profit to which the ownership of an option is supposed to entitle you. For instance, if your call proves profitable early, the stock should be sold short, and the option should not yet be called. Then, if the stock goes down, you cover the short position at a profit. You still have your option with weeks left to run. Its possibilities can then be exploited all over again, like those patented shirt collars after which being used only have to be wiped off with a damp cloth. But if the stock continues upward, you merely call for your hundred shares, deliver it, and then you must be satisfied with a single profit. What I have thus far been describing is the use of options for sheer, unadulterated speculation. What is put forward by option brokers as being the proper or legitimate use has an entirely different function, to limit speculative losses. By this program, options are bought as a hedge against an actual position in a stock. Suppose you are long 100 shares of a stock. If you will immediately purchase a put on that stock for 100 shares, you will thereby definitely limit the amount of money you can lose in this transaction. Similarly, the theory goes, if you are short in the market, you hedge by buying calls. This protection lasts for the period the option is written for, 30, 60, 90 days, sometimes much longer. There is no denying the fact that the above procedure supplies the speculator with definite insurance. Term insurance, actually. But like all other forms of insurance, it costs money to buy. Thus, the simple question is set, 
is the price of the insurance commensurate with the amount of the protection attained. Unfortunately, this problem cannot be solved mathematically. It can be attacked empirically, but this method of research is likely to be costly. In Defense of the Pure Gamble Perversely enough, it is the use of options as sheer speculation that exercises a malign fascination on this writer. I do not know of anyone else who has a good word to say for this form of gamble. However, let us compare it with the almost universally adopted method of speculation, buying or selling short stocks on margin. In the first place, the option is the true long shot of stock gambling. A man with $1,500 cannot take a position in more than a hundred shares, if that, of a moderately priced stock. He can, however, buy a 30-day option on a thousand shares, if he feels sufficiently heady about its immediate future. It is quite conceivable that the stock will move ten points in the proper direction in the course of a month. In this case, the option buyer wins ten thousand dollars for his stake, and the margin buyer only a thousand dollars for the same stake. The poor fellow who only bought as much as he could pay for with $1,500 shows a profit of less than $500. There is nothing particularly improbable about that pleasant little story, but I never happened to be around when it occurred. My second point, oddly, is a moral one. When a man buys an option, he pays for it with his small stake, and then if his venture is unsuccessful, that money is gone forever. Nevertheless, that is all the money he is going to shell out on this particular venture, come what may. Neither his subsequent folly nor wisdom can cause him to get involved any deeper. The margin buyer, on the other hand, frequently thinks he is going to take a limited gamble only. When things go wrong, he gets a little hysterical, which he didn't expect to do. He puts up more money and eventually loses his patrimony, which he didn't expect to do. It is the case, quoted previously, of failing to get off the 20th Century Limited at 125th Street. While I am prating in this objectionable way about morals, it is only fair to consider a popular moral objection to the gambling option buyer. I, says the margin buyer, am actually putting up a substantial amount of money toward an actual purchase of some stock. I am joining in a forward-looking, constructive, patriotic sort of way, in a corporate enterprise. Your option buyer is merely making a complex wager with someone about the near future price of the stock. A little further examination will show, however, that the functional differences between these two speculative fellow travelers is not so great. The margin buyer never sees his stock any more than does the option buyer. He doesn't really own it. It is not registered in his name. He can arrange to be admitted to stockholders' meetings if he wants to, but he doesn't want to, nor would he accomplish anything much if he did. Both men receive dividends, if any, on the books, not into their pockets. The broker who sold the stock represents someone who either has the stock or who hustles out and buys it. The Catch it would be monstrous to leave an impressionable reader with the idea that the buying of options is a reliable way to make money. But the practice has so few spokesmen that I have taken it on myself to suggest that it has at least as much to recommend it as more approved speculative methods. Options are infinitely attractive to dream about. We all know many stocks which have moved much more than 10 points in a month, and more than 50 points in three months. But when a man stops dreaming these transactions and tries doing them, something different always seems to happen. The customer who buys some options soon discovers that his costs are considerably higher than at first appears. Commissions, stamps, and disappointing executions on the floor all hamper him. These, however, are only details. Choosing the proper stock at the proper time for the proper move is difficult. But the greatest difficulty, I am grieved to report, arises after all has been successfully done. Option brokers are fond of pointing out all the advantageous ways there are of operating once the option gets into the money. It is indeed the truth. One can do more fascinating things with an option than an inventive boy can do with a set of mechano. 
but for some subtle reason, whatever one does at this point usually turns out to be wrong. For instance, suppose we have a profit of three points after one week has elapsed of a 30-day call on 100 shares. Shall we do the simplest thing, which is to do nothing and wait for the big 10-point rise? Maybe, but perhaps the stock will go down again, never to rally, and then our chance for profit is gone forever. Well then, shall we sell 100 shares short? Then, if the stock continues up, we shall only have a profit of 300, when we could have had a 1,000, which is what we originally had in mind, dopes that we are. Or shall we sell 50 shares short? That is attractive. That will get us some more profit, whichever way the stock moves. But it will only get us one half the possible profit. So we don't much care to do that. Thus, what usually happens on those infrequent occasions when we have chosen the right stock at the right time is that we end up with a picayune profit, if any, plus a nice foundation for a set of stomach ulcers. In conclusion, I leave you with this suggestion. The next time you get a hot, fast tip, quote the option market. I do not say that you should necessarily buy a call, but you should at least mull over for a little the fact that there exists a group of gentlemen who seem willing to wager that this stock is not going to go so very high in the next 30 or 90 days after all. Chapter 7 The Good Old Days and the Great Captains in attempting to find out just what, if anything, was good in the good old days, it is necessary to determine when the good old days were. In some simple but not straightforward Wall Street mines, they were any days that preceded the Securities and Exchange Commission, when there weren't no Ten Commandments and a man could raise a thirst. Oh, for the days when the most important rules were don't rebate on commissions, don't shoot the specialists, and don't smoke opium on the floor during trading hours. It would be more correct and more honest to recognize that the good old days were simply boom days, like the booms of the late twenties, the late teens, and the late nineteenth century. Come to think of it, that was a fairish little boom in thirty-six, thirty-seven, wasn't it, fellows? That time the SEC was all but sitting in the game with us, joggling our elbows, breathing down the backs of our necks, and making suggestions right in the middle of the bidding. They often emptied the ashtrays, but they never served any beer and sandwiches. They certainly didn't start the boom or nourish it, and I don't believe they had much to do with stopping it. Booms go boom. In our moments of sober thought, we all realize that booms are bad things, not good. But nearly all of us have a secret hankering for another one. Another little orgy wouldn't do us any harm, is the feeling that persists both downtown and up. This is quite human, because in the last boom, we acted so silly. If we're old enough, we probably acted silly in the last three. We either got in too late, or out too late, or both. But now that we are experienced, just give us one more shot at a good, reliable, runaway boom. The IQ of a Big Shot There has evolved a considerable saga of the deeds and daring do of the great speculators of the good old days. I shall not touch upon their morals, such as they were, since that subject has been covered with completeness and passion by others. I am more interested in their mentalities, which are popularly considered to have been very high. The men under discussion are those who made and often lost their fortunes in stocks, trading them, manipulating them, cornering them, and generally performing razzle-dazzle with them. This excludes such men as Rockefeller and Carnegie, who were primarily engaged in such realistic businesses as oil and steel. Their Wall Street interests only grew secondarily from that. But your true speculator starts near the corner of Wall and Broad and doesn't wander farther away than the next two tickers. He knows that in some savage, unvisited spot like Jersey City, a corporation is actually a business, but he doesn't really think that important. 
What fascinates him is that against this vague concept of a living business, certain pieces of engraved paper can be issued, and that with those pieces of paper, thrilling games can be played. He does not easily conceive the business in terms of workers, management, products, processes, markets, and patents. Much more simply, he thinks of the Norfolk and Western Railroad as NFK and the United States Steel Corporation as X. What is most clearly in his mind is that if he wants to make a play, a fellow can always find a large close market in X, but not in NFK. This inability to grasp ultimate realities is the outstanding mental deficiency of the speculator, small as well as great. He is an incurable romantic and usually egotistical. His mind is fast, active, and resourceful, and in a peculiarly limited way, shrewd. That is, he is shrewd in everything save that he is constantly, day by day, laying himself open to the possibility of being ruined. He seems to believe, with Mother Goose, that a treetop is the proper place for a cradle. Nowhere is this lack of reality more tragic than in the speculator's failure to comprehend what money really is. He doesn't know what it is, though his stenographer does. He thinks it is an item on the right-hand side of a broker's statement. He doesn't know what it is for, though you and I do, and could easily tell him. He thinks it is for swinging a big line of some active common stock. If a man makes thirty million dollars and then loses the entire thirty million and some more to boot, would you say that such a man is quite bright in the head? I will raise no objection if a man has thirty million and, in the course of trying to amuse himself, loses twenty-nine and a half million, for in this case no real harm has been done and no sympathy need be extended. But this rarely happens. When they really begin to go, they go for everything they have, and some more that they haven't. Frequently such men are given second and third and even fourth chances. They blarney their way into another big grub stake and start over. This is not so difficult as it might seem to you and me. The feeling in Wall Street is that a man whose business record consists in having made thirty millions and lost thirty-five millions is a whale of a boy and a valuable business associate. The funny part is that this is often true. While the net returns of his efforts over a period of time amount to a loss of five million dollars, he is, undeniably, the man who can stir things up and give a firm action. I know this hardly seems fair. No one is going to set up you or me with a huge credit, and our business record is much superior to his. You and I never lost any five million dollars. No, sir, we wouldn't do such a thing. On the score, our commercial achievement is five million ahead of his, plus what we have gotten over a period of years in the weekly pay envelope. But another great advantage that he has got over us is that he owes his debtors such huge amounts. His debtors feel, possibly mistakenly, that their best chance of getting their big marker back is to supply him with another bankroll so that he can start operating again. Our debtors are different. They are the dentist, the tailor, and the finance company. They don't have the same conception of it at all. I should like to carry this inquiry into intelligence a little further and ask a second question. What do you think of the mentality of a man who goes down to Wall Street with very little and wins, by speculation, thirty millions, none of which he has as yet lost? My own considered opinion is that he, too, is pretty much of a loony. In order to make his second unimportant million, he had to first risk his first precious million. Obviously, he did so, and did it time and again. That he happens to have been successful each time does not really change the picture. What could he have been thinking of each time he took all those risks? The very contemplation of it makes my bourgeois soul shudder. It is now high time to allow the reader to ask a pertinent question. He asks with justice and some asperity, Just what authority have you, sitting at that desk with an ink smudge on your nose, to criticize the mental qualities of a man who has made thirty million dollars?
I figure I have the same authority as the fan at a ball game who yells, You big dope! when the Yankee shortstop scoops up a hard grounder and throws it to the wrong base. The fan is conceded to have a right to express this sound opinion, even though it is admitted that if the fan had been in the shortstop's place, he would not have stopped the ball at all, save possibly with his Adam's apple. Anyway, he certainly wouldn't have thrown it to the wrong base. Speculation on Speculation Thus far we have been inquiring as to whether large speculation is a sensible occupation in itself. I should now like to look into a somewhat different matter. When they are speculating, how much of what the speculators are doing is wisdom and foresight and experience, and how much is sheer guessing? Certainly they never admit to themselves that they are making guesses, or they would have to quit the business at which they have so much fun. If they are acting on guesses or hunches, as I suspect they are, they are the world's best rationalizers in finding profound reasons for their hunches. Consider tape readers, for instance. I have observed the devotees of this peculiar profession on and off for many years. They claim that the tape, worming its way out of the ticker, tells the initiate a complex story that cannot be perceived by others. Maybe so. The old-time speculators were all popularly supposed to number tape-reading among their accomplishments, just as we assume that Arturo Toscanini can play the piano, although we have never seen him do it. To me, it seems that tape-reading is very light-reading indeed. There seems so little to read. The tape records the transactions on the floor in the order of occurrence and shows the volume and prices at which they take place. It does not show who the buyers and sellers were, or what they were thinking of when they bought and sold, or what they intend to do next, if anything. Nor does it print anything about what is about to occur in Europe, Washington, or the Dust Bowl. Tape readers will reply that what I don't know about the tape will fill a large book. They feel that after years of peering at those marching prices, they have developed a trading instinct. I have heard a man boast that when the market was breaking, he could tell it with his eyes closed just by listening to the ticker. This feat could also be performed by your little niece, since the ticker does set up a clatter during a break. But I don't see how either of them can foretell how severe the break is going to be, or how long it will last, even with their eyes open. There is a well-known story of a shrewd plunger and tape reader of the old days who received a strong tip to buy a certain railroad stock. What he first did, to the consternation of beholders, was to sell 10,000 shares short. But it turned out that he had indulged in this expensive gesture simply to test the market and determine whether the tip was sincere. He watched the tape, observed that the market took his offerings in an orderly fashion, and was thus convinced. So he turned around, bought in the 10,000 he had sold, and then bought an additional 50,000. In practically no time, he had made a fortune. To me, this anecdote has a distinctively dreamlike quality, and I noted that this method of trading has not persisted into recent times. No doubt this performance did occur at least once, there was no limit to what those megalomaniacs might do. If the plunger made a common practice of this stunt, I do not envy him, but I should have liked to have been his broker. I do not know of any way to determine authoritatively the question of how much of a speculator's activity is sheer guesswork disguised and how much is sensible. Bear in mind that we are discussing speculators, not crooks, a crook's business is realistic. So long as he is effectively crooked, he is not a speculator at all. What we are discussing is speculators whose actions are prompted by tape reading, chart reading, statistical analysis, inside information, trading instinct, and all of that. Let us toy with the notion that all of it, or nearly all of it, is actually guesswork. But this cannot be so, it is objected, because a certain few men, year in and year out, who are speculators, not crooks, make a good thing of it. There are not many of them, but there are, and always have been, a few, and they win. 
Doesn't this prove that successful speculation is something more than good luck? The answer, I suspect, is no. And this is why I suspect it. A Brief Excursion into Probabilities There is a mathematical demonstration of what would happen, what must happen, if a large number of men were set to playing a game of pure chance against each other. The demonstration is interesting, but the reader must determine for himself whether or not it is analogous to Wall Street speculation. Here it is. Let us have 400,000 men and women engage in this contest at one time, something like the number in this country who try being speculators. We line them up, facing each other in pairs, across a refectory table miles long. Each player is going to play the person facing him a series of games, the game chosen being a matter of pure luck, say, matching coins. 200,000 on one side of the table face 200,000 on the other side. If the reader is at all mathematically inclined, he should cease reading and work out for himself what is now bound to occur. Otherwise... The referee gives a signal for the first game, and 400,000 coins flash in the sun as they are tossed. The scorers make their tabulations and discover that 200,000 people are winners and 200,000 are losers. Then the second game is played. Of the original 200,000 winners, about half of them win again. We now have about 100,000 who have won two games and an equal number who have been so unfortunate as to lose both games. The rest have so far broken even. The simplest thing from now on is to keep our eyes on the winners. No one is ever much interested in the losers anyway. The third game is played, and of the 100,000 who have won both games, half of them are again successful. These 50,000 in the fourth game are reduced to 25,000, and in the fifth, 12,500. These 12,500 have now won five straight without a loss, and are no doubt beginning to fancy themselves as coin flippers. They feel they have an instinct for it. However, in the sixth game, 6,250 of them are disappointed and amazed to find that they have finally lost and perhaps some of them start a congressional investigation. But the victorious 6,250 play on and are successively reduced in number until less than a thousand are left. This little band has won some nine straight without a loss, and by this time most of them have at least a local reputation for their ability. People come from some distance to consult them about their method of calling heads and tails, and they modestly give explanations of how they have achieved their success. Eventually, there are about a dozen men who have won every single time for about 15 games. These are regarded as the experts, the greatest coin flippers in history, the men who never lose, and they have their biographies written. Admittedly, it is preposterous to suggest that stock speculation is like coin flipping. I know that there is more skill to stock speculation. What I have never been able to determine is how much more. Down will come baby. When a speculator is riding the crest, he does indeed give a convincing appearance of infallibility. Not only are all beholders impressed, but he cannot help being impressed with himself. The deference he receives from his associates, his rivals, and the head waiters of nightclubs is a sincere and moving thing. But when he starts to toboggan down the other side of the hill, what becomes of the wisdom that was so evident a short time before? Who has gotten inside his skull and tampered with that fine brain? Sometimes he recovers himself before hitting bottom, and sometimes he doesn't. If he doesn't, there finally comes the day when the collar of his last sulka shirt is frayed. Then he, who found it easy to produce a couple of thousand dollars in a day, finds it dreadfully hard to earn that much in a year. Often the cycle is brief. There was that day when, without much grace, he bade farewell forever to the company of poor men. Then perhaps it was only a few years later, with less grace. He awkwardly tries to rejoin them, and finds that they are not much interested in listening to his former exploits. 
In Thackeray's Vanity Fair, there is a masterly description of a ruined speculator, which demonstrates that the genus has not altered an iota in over a century. Old Mr. Snedley was not a realist either. He felt strongly that that scoundrel Napoleon had escaped from Elba and rallied all France to his banner chiefly for the purpose of making it impossible for him, Mr. Snedley, to meet his obligations on Contango Day. Most of the great speculators either ended their days in penury or came sickeningly close to it one or more times. An interesting exception was Hetty Green, who never took a backward step. She started rich and soon got richer, and after that she got richer and richer. But Mrs. Green was something of a realist, being both a woman and a miser. Few great speculators are either. They For the loosest use of a pronoun in the English language, I nominate they, as in the common Wall Street expressions, they are accumulating the coppers, they are taking profits, they are going to put Chrysler through par, and they won't let this market run away until after the Republicans have won the election. Who are they? They are either the great speculators and manipulators, or the daemons of the netherworld, or both. A generation or so ago, it seems probable that they had a tangible existence. They were probably Daniel Drew and Cornelius Vanderbilt, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk, and some other human oddities. Then the markets were small, and they were big. They played their fantastic games with the price of gold or the stock of the Erie Railroad, not an enviable property even then. And they made and broke their followers and each other. But by the late 1920s, the markets were huge, and they, though often invoked, were deities of a very limited power. Did Mr. Mike Meehan put radio up, or did radio put Mr. Meehan up? Similar questions can be asked of Mr. Cutton, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Livermore, Mr. Durant, and the six Fisher brothers, and countless others whose names were then breathed with awe. Certainly, when their respective pets started down, most of them tried to halt the decline. They looked as though they were trying to stop an express train by leaning gingerly over the track and blowing smoke rings at it. For the last ten years, there haven't been any great speculators or manipulators at all. But the use of the pronoun they continues unabated. It must be the daemons these days exclusively. Manipulators so much has been written and argued about manipulation of stocks that I am reluctant to add much more. The business is based on the fairly sound hypothesis that the public is chiefly interested in buying stocks that are going up. Thus, the manipulators select a stock that they think is underpriced and that has a good story for a tip to go with it. And they try to see to it that it goes up. They also spread the tip, of the truth of which they have carefully convinced themselves, and which may indeed turn out to be true. If the manipulators make the price rise by washed sales, which are not true transactions and don't cost anything but commissions, my opinion is that this is a fraud and that a moderate stay in jail would not be out of place for them, even though personally they are jolly fellows. It is, of course, equally pernicious fraud if they spread false information to go with the wash sales and a double sentence should be in order. But if they make the price go up by actually buying the stock and paying money for it, I tend to wish them luck, if for no other reason than that they are certainly going to need it. For at the conclusion of this first part of the operation, they find themselves the owners of a great deal of stock, purchased at ascending prices. At this point, the gullible public is supposed to come galloping in to buy the stock from the manipulators at still higher prices. But not infrequently, the gullible public acts like an overfed trout and just pays no attention. When this happens, the operators, who in the beginning fancied themselves as devilish manipulators, wake up one morning to find that they have become involuntary investors. Manipulation, like other frowned-on practices I have cited, is not an easy road to fortune. I recall a correspondence of many years ago 
a pool manager having been supplied with large funds by a pool of a dozen men to hoist a certain stock, was having no success whatever. He had bought plenty of stock, and the stock was still down. He wrote a letter to each of the members of the pool, explaining at length the hard luck he had run into, and asking them each for an additional contribution of fifty thousand dollars. With this, he assured them the chestnuts could be pulled out of the fire, and a handsome profit would be substituted for an apparent loss. One of his replies read as follows: "Dear Mister Blank." Enclosed, please find the check for fifty thousand dollars, which you requested in yours of the fifteenth. It was not really necessary for you to assume an apologetic tone. I am sure that you have done your skillful best in this matter, and I am sufficiently experienced to understand that you have encountered reverses which could not be foreseen. Trusting that our enterprise will turn out in the profitable way that you outline, I remain sincerely blank. P.S. That is what I would have written to you. You deleted, if I had been sucker enough to enclose any check for fifty thousand dollars. A bowl of nickels. The good old days of the twenties are gone, no doubt forever. If this conclusion seems too tragic, ask yourself a couple of questions. One. Are you quite sure that you would care to see all those people who had big money then have it again? Two, just how grand was the grandeur that was Rome, as its grandest? In the later twenties, there was very little poverty, at least among the white collar and stiff collar classes, and that was dandy. There was also very little grace, taste, or humility. We had practically attained the goal of a chicken in every pot, and were well launched toward a loftier cultural achievement. This was a hangover every Sunday morning for everyone obtained at the country club dance the evening before. Then, after a brisk bromo seltzer, out into the great outdoors to play golf, originally a Scotch game, for fifty dollars a hole with carryovers. In 1929, there was a luxurious club car. Which ran each weekday morning into the Pennsylvania station. When the train stopped, the assorted millionaires who had been playing bridge, reading the paper, and comparing their fortunes filed out at the front end of the car. Near the door, there was placed a silver bowl with a quantity of nickels in it. Those who needed a nickel in change for the subway ride downtown took one. They were not expected to put anything back in exchange. This was not money. It was one of those minor conveniences, like a quill toothpick for which nothing is charged. It was only five cents. There have been many explanations of the sudden debacle of October 1929. The explanation I prefer is that the eye of Jehovah, a wrathful God, happened to chance in October on that bowl. In sudden, understandable annoyance, Jehovah kicked over the financial structure of the United States and thus saw to it that the bowl of free nickels disappeared forever. Chapter Eight: Investment, Many Questions, and a Few Answers. Investment and speculation are said to be two different things, and the prudent man is advised to engage in the one and avoid the other. This is something like explaining to the troubled adolescent that love and passion are two different things. He perceives that they are different, but they don't seem quite different enough to clear up his problems. Investment and speculation have been so often defined that a couple more faulty definitions should do no harm. The science of economics having reached a point where further confusion is impossible. Thus, speculation is an effort, probably unsuccessful, to turn a little money into a lot. Investment is an effort which should be successful to prevent a lot of money from becoming a little. If you take a thousand dollars down to Wall Street and attempt to run it up to twenty-five thousand dollars in the course of a year, you are speculating. If you take twenty-five thousand dollars down there and attempt to earn a thousand dollars a year with it by buying twenty-five four-percent bonds, you are investing. 
The odds against your being successful in the first venture are roughly 25 to 1. The odds against the success of the second venture are odds-on, or something like 1 to 25. Thus the difference becomes one of degree rather than of kind. Of course, a bond salesman never says, Ah, come on, mister, buy these bonds. They will yield you 4% return, and there's scarcely one chance in 25 that they will go bust. The salesman tries to avoid even thinking of his bonds in such ghastly terms. He prefers to base his thinking on a more orderly and conventional pattern. Thus, common stocks are speculative. Preferred stocks are not nearly so speculative. Debenture bonds are pretty darn safe and mortgage bonds are safe. Unfortunately, the exceptions to this are enormous and continuous. Year after year, it is demonstrated that the common stocks of some corporations are a great deal safer than the mortgage bonds of certain others. Headaches of the Wealthy People with money feel that they should be able to rent out their money at a modest rental to people who need it, and that there shouldn't be any real danger of the money being lost. Marxists feel that this entire procedure is perfectly disgusting. In any case, the procedure is becoming so extremely difficult that the Marxist must feel gratified. The problems of safe investment seem particularly tough at the present moment. They were never really easy, though at times they seem to be. Great family fortunes seldom last long. Occasionally the heirs spend all the money. More often they lose it in the course of investing it. For instance, a century ago it must have been very easy to sell canal bonds to the most conservative type of investor. The story that went with them was cogent and reasonable. Canals were far and away the best and cheapest method of transporting goods. Commerce could not get along without them. It was difficult and costly to build competing ones, etc., etc. We all know what happened to canal bonds then, and what seems to be happening to railroad bonds now. And what is going to happen to your good toll bridge bonds, madam, just as soon as someone invents a device which will enable automobiles to leap over rivers? Trust companies and investment counselors warn us that our investments, even the most conservative ones, will not take care of themselves, but that they must be constantly watched. They never said a truer word. But in my case, at least, the use of the word watch is unfortunate. It calls to my mind the common promise of a customer's man to watch for you a certain stock in which you have just taken a speculative commitment. This promise he assiduously keeps. He watches every quotation of the stock on the tape, and if the stock gets weak, he doesn't even go out for lunch. He munches a sandwich and continues to stare at it. If it breaks badly, he watches even harder. His eyes begin to bug out a little. But the stock is not made self-conscious by his staring. It continues down. Watching is apparently more effective on kettles than on securities. It is not known at the present time just how much more effective this is than the watching done by investment counselors. No box score is kept in the investment council game and no batting averages. My own method of research was to ask a number of investment counselors how their clients were doing. They all replied that their clients were doing quite well, thank you, taking into consideration, of course, this, that, and the other. That marks the practical limits of research in this field. You can't ask for the books to be thrown open for your study because you will be told quite rightly that their client's business is none of your business. Before going further into this subject, I had better include a note as to whom I'm talking about. It must be understood that when I refer to investment counselors, I am only referring to investment counselors who are investment counselors, as Gertrude Stein might put it. There are less than a hundred of these firms in existence. Unfortunately, there are also several thousand burglars extant, all of whom refer to themselves these days as investment counsel. This is not the fault of the bona fide investment counsel. It is no doubt a subtle compliment to them. Some of these other gentry allocate the funds between themselves and their clients in the ancient classic manner, i.e., at the close of the day's business, they take all the money and throw it up in the air. Everything that sticks to the ceiling belongs to the clients. 
The underlying principle of the genuine investment counsel seems to be sound and important. It is a mundane one, i.e., it has to do with how the counselors are paid off. They receive a stated fee for giving advice. They do not get their pay in commissions or profits on trades, as most brokers and dealers do. Nor are they tempted to sell the client some security which they own and which, by a mischance, no one else at the moment seems to care to buy. Thus a wealthy person may at least feel sure that the advice he gets from investment counsel is sincere and unbiased by hope of gain or fear of loss. This reduces the wealthy person's problems to two. One, is there such a thing as consistently useful financial advice? Two, if there is, which investment counselor can supply it? In spite of the fact that the counsel's method of compensation approaches the ideal, he has some odd troubles collecting his reasonable fees. Sometimes a number of rich men will band together. Collecting his reasonable fees. Sometimes a number of rich men will band together and send one of their number in to get and pay for the service. Then they will all use it. If it surprises you that there are millionaires who will stoop to such petty chiseling, you should get out and meet more millionaires. Sometimes the advice, though perhaps good, does not seem sufficiently spectacular. There was a man who took his large estate to the investment council and emerged looking a little dazed. What did they tell you to do? asked his friend. They told me to sell everything and put all the money except thirty-five hundred into government bonds. What did they tell you to do with the thirty-five hundred? They told me to give it to them. A little wonderful advice. For no fee at all, I am prepared to offer to any wealthy person an investment program which will last a lifetime and will not only preserve the estate, but greatly increase it. Like other great ideas, this one is simple. When there is a stock market boom and everyone is scrambling for common stocks, take all your common stocks and sell them. Take the proceeds and buy conservative bonds. No doubt the stocks you sold will go higher. Pay no attention to this. Just wait for the depression, which will come sooner or later. When this depression or panic becomes a national catastrophe, sell out the bonds, perhaps at a loss, and buy back the stocks. No doubt the stocks will go still lower. Again, pay no attention. Wait for the next boom. Continue to repeat this operation as long as you live, and you'll have the pleasure of dying rich. A glance at financial history will show that there was never a generation for whom this advice would not have worked splendidly. But it distresses me to report that I have never enjoyed the social acquaintance of anyone who managed to do it. It looks as easy as rolling off a log, but it isn't. The chief difficulties, of course, are psychological. It requires buying bonds when bonds are generally unpopular, and buying stocks when stocks are universally detested. I suspect that there are actually a few people who do something like this, even though I have never had the pleasure of meeting them. I suspect it because someone must buy the stocks when the suckers sell at those awful prices, a fact usually outside the consciousness of the public and of financial reporters. An experienced reporter's poetic account in the paper following a day of terrible panic reads this way. Large selling was in evidence at the opening bell and gained steadily in volume and violence throughout the morning session. At noon, a rally, dishearteningly brief, took place as a result of short covering. But a new selling wave soon threw the market into utter chaos, and during the final hour, equities were thrown overboard in huge lots without regard for price or value. The public reads the papers, and reading the foregoing, it gets the impression that on that catastrophic day, everyone sold and nobody bought except that little band of shorts who most likely didn't exist. Of course, there is just no truth in that at all. If on that day the terrific selling amounted to 7,365,000 shares, the volume of the buying can also be calculated. In this case, it was 7,365,000 shares. Price and Value, Our Special Market Letter 
At this point, we shall take up the subject of price and value, because any financial writer who doesn't explain this naughty matter has his union card taken away from him. I shall not beat around the bush with generalities, but I will step right in and analyze for you the price and value of the best-known stock in the world. This is the common stock of the United States Steel Corporation, familiarly called Steel, Big Steel, and Big X by its many cronies. First, as to price, on which I happen to be well informed, I can state without fear of successful contradiction that steel closed yesterday quoted at 57 and 5 eighths to 58, last sale 57 and 3 quarters. This price was arrived at because at about 3 p.m. yesterday, someone, maybe one of the specialists, maybe a lady in Brooklyn, was willing to pay 57 and 5 eighths for at least 100 shares, and someone else, maybe another specialist, maybe a fat man with a win in Brussels, was willing to sell at 58. Goodness only knows what were the motives of these people. So you can see that the price of U.S. steel was determined in an extremely chancy fashion. There is only one nice thing to be said in favor of that price. It was a very definite number and good all over the world at that time. Now let us turn to that eternal verity, value. We will examine the corporation's earnings, which are applicable to the common stock over a period of the last ten years. My word, there are more losses than earnings. There was a period of time when not even the preferred stock earned its keep. And now they have a large bond issue out. And what will be the effects of the war? That just shows you how silly a price of 57 and three quarters is. 17 and three quarters would be more like it, and a man ought to have his head examined who pays more than that for it in anything except Confederate money. But, on the other hand, and notwithstanding and not so fast, there are other elements in the picture and a broader viewpoint to be considered. The steel industry is the most basic of basic industries, and the United States Steel Corporation is and has been for 40 years a veritable giant in the field, irreproducible and unapproachable. The total of its yearly losses during the late Depression is less than its earnings in any one of the several profitable years prior to 1930. And it would not require much of an increase in operations for great profits again to pour forth. And what will be the effect of the war? Look at that big bond issue. How easily and on what favorable terms that financing was done. In view of these and many other bullish factors, it is hard to see why this, the most seasoned stock known to finance, is not selling at a hundred fifty-seven and three quarters. And who shall call us visionary to suggest two hundred fifty-seven and three quarters? It once did a trifle better than that and looked cheap to a great many experienced people. It is quite unnecessary for you all to crowd around in this fashion, thanking me for the above analysis of the true value of steel common. It really wasn't difficult. The steel business is a comprehensible one, and all facts and figures on it are published in Iron Age. In many other industries, such precise figuring is not possible. The analysis of a chemical company, for example, is more difficult. After considering everything else, the investor never knows just when one of the company's scientists, working in a green eye shade in the research laboratories, will discover how to distill vitamin V out of discarded cellophane wrappers. I will conclude this discussion of price and value with the following unimportant occurrence, circa 1928. There was at that time engaged in the bank stock business, along with an awful lot of others, a large red-necked Texan. He had brought to his profession a booming Texas voice and a calcified conscience. On this occasion, he had just sold a customer 20 shares of guaranteed trust company stock at $760 a share at a moment when it could have been purchased anywhere else at $730. The customer, the big sore head, had just found this out and had called back with a view toward remonstrance. The Texan cut him short. Sir, he boomed, you all don't appreciate what the policy of this firm is. This here firm selects investments for its clients, not on a basis of price, but of value. Cash is a long-term investment. 
For those wealthy people who have not yet found in these pages an investment program which appeals to them, here is another plan which at least has certain originality. It was outlined to me by a bond trader one afternoon. We had been discussing the broad history of investment bonds, a depressing subject. The man had spent the last thirty years trading bonds with other people's money. His own money he had always carefully spent. I finally said, what a hopeless game. Tell me, Mac, what would you do if you had today $250,000 of your own? He answered with such promptness that I could see he had given a good deal of thought to this improbability. I would put it into 25 envelopes in cash of $10,000 each. I would put the envelopes into a safe deposit box. I have been told you can get a small one, such as I would need, for only $6 a year. At the beginning of each year, I would take out an envelope, and I would risk not living more than 25 years longer. That would give me $200 a week. But since a man has to be doing something, and I like gambling, I would live on a hundred a week, and with the other, I would play the horse races. That would give me a real interest in life. Most weeks I'd live at the rate of a hundred, but occasionally at the rate of a thousand. And for an added pleasure, I could laugh at the income tax collector. But the percentage against you on the horses is certainly as bad as in the market, I reminded him. Worse, he said cheerfully, but playing the horses is at least fun. Your Way of Life and the Basis Book The Basis Book, usually bound in limp black and religious in appearance, is a collection of tables by which bondmen can quickly calculate precise income yields on various bond investments. A good investment advisor is supposed to run his finger across the tables to as high a yield as is commensurate with the amount of safety required by the particular investor. And his experienced finger should stop right there like a divining rod. Just how far his finger should venture towards the right-hand side of the page is a matter of tremendous importance for the investor. The problem is not limited to mathematics. It invades the borders of philosophy. The investor's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are all at stake. Take care of the pennies, and the dollars will take care of themselves, is better than a half-truth, about a five-eighths truth, I should say. At least as accurate is, take care of the million dollars, and the pennies will take care of themselves. The British, as a race have been engaged with the problems of capital investment for a longer period than we have, and accordingly have reached a greater maturity regarding it. Have you ever noticed that when you ask a Britisher about a man's wealth, you get an answer quite different from that an American gives you? The American says, I wouldn't be surprised if he's worth close to a million dollars. The Englishman says, I fancy he has five thousand pounds a year. The Englishman's habitual way of speaking and thinking about wealth is, of course, much closer to the nub of the matter. A man's true wealth is his income, not his bank balance. There are times and places when it is better to have a hundred thousand dollars than it was to have two hundred thousand at another time and place. And there have been other occasions when it was better to have a cargo of potatoes or a supply of axes and glass beads than either sum. The emphasis in the investment problem is usually placed on the proper selection of securities. I suggest that the emphasis would be better placed on how the investor intends to spend his income. The initial mistakes are made in this latter department. The wrong securities are chosen largely as a result of this initial philosophic error. The peculiar investment plan of my horse-betting gentleman lacked nobility, but it did have the virtue of being modest and hence workable, just so long as the investor would abide by his promises to himself. Consider the case of a family which has, besides a modest earned income, $100,000 to invest. Just now it seems that they ought to be able to glean from this an average yield of something better than $3,000 a year, with reasonable safety. No, I don't quite know what reasonable safety means, but all we investment men use the expression. Suppose the family invest the money at this rate. Their chief problem now, I suggest, is not so much to watch their investments as to watch themselves. 
So long as they can attune their material needs and their social dignity to that income, they can retain that reasonable safety. But perhaps the time comes when the family feels they can no longer hold their heads up on the block unless little Paula goes to a fashionable finishing school. For that, it will be necessary to jack up their income yield to $5,500. Perhaps the family's feeling about Paula's education is unreal and unreasonable, but this is a problem more for discussion with their minister or a psychologist than with an investment broker. Their investment man, however, can arrange the larger yield in a jiffy if the family asks for it. Let us suppose he arranges it. He simply sells out the conservative bonds and substitutes riskier securities. Little Paula goes off to the school with a cute wardrobe, and it is to be hoped that while there she gets jammed full of fascinating social graces. She may come to need them in all earnest, because by the time she is graduated, her marriage portion may indeed consist exclusively of social graces. Chapter 9 Reform, Some Yeas and Nays The preceding chapter has no doubt suggested that the greatest of investment mistakes is in trying for too high a return with its attendant tragic risk. Not many will deny that, but that is only the half of it or perhaps only the quarter of it. Our subject does not seem to admit any hundred percent truths. There is a reverse side to this picture, which reflects a condition that has been particularly in evidence these last five years. This is a tendency on the part of men in a fiduciary capacity, including trustees, executors, and lawyers, to play so safe with a client's funds that they just don't perform any useful service at all. They take the family's $100,000 and invest it at a yield that is closer to zero percent than has ever been seen before. They tell the inquiring family to run along and play, if it can find some inexpensive game. They apparently feel that they have earned their fees by putting the money in a safe place and by reframing from stealing any of it. An intense and needed reform wave has swept Wall Street in recent years, and the tendency just mentioned may be cited as one of its lesser and less fortunate results. The advisor who gets next to nothing in yield for his client isn't doing much for the client. He is simply avoiding responsibility for himself. He claims that he must duck responsibility, that he doesn't get paid much for being right, and that if he should be wrong these days, he might easily lose his reputation. He says that he might possibly even be called for by some large, taciturn men wearing blue suits with brass buttons. I believe he exaggerates, but he has got a point there. Was it stolen, or did you lose it? This book has thus far skirted two juicy topics, Wall Street crookedness and the many steps that have been lately taken to regulate it. This should work no hardship on the inquiring student, because there are reams of printed material on these subjects. This book has chiefly tried to paint a picture of thousands of erring humans of varying degrees of goodwill, solemnly engaged in the business of predicting the unpredictable. It has been further suggested that, to this effort, most of them bring a certain cockeyed sincerity. The picture in the popular mind has always been more sinister, the public feels that Wall Streeters are not dunces at all, that they are crooks and scoundrels and very clever ones at that, that they sell for millions what they know is worthless, in short, that they are villains, not children. Everyone interested helps to perpetuate this picture. The outsider believes it readily enough, else how did those stuck-up Wall Streeters get so rich? The burnt customer certainly prefers to believe that he has been robbed rather than that he has been a fool on the advice of fools. Even Wall Street men themselves tend to encourage the idea. They are ever ready to confide to you what they know of the inside dishonesty of someone else. Faced with the huge losses investors have suffered, their egos subconsciously suggest to them that it is better to be regarded as a Machiavelli than as one who has spent his adult life engaged in mumbo-jumbo. The crookedness of Wall Street is, in my opinion, an overrated phenomenon. The hearts of Wall Street men are not more or less black than the hearts of the men in the sausage-cover game. 
There is probably the same percentage of malpractice, but the Wall Street depredations are more spectacular. They involve vastly greater sums of money, and they make more interesting reading. Best of all, they suggest to the public an excuse for the public's own folly. The indignation school of writers never tires of pointing out the millions that are stolen in the street. But while the millions are being stolen, the billions are being lost. Nothing crooked, just bad luck and bad brains met together in an effort to do something that couldn't be done in the first place. There are, of course, plenty of ways of stealing money in Wall Street. They range from the stealing of $12.50, an eighth on a hundred shares of stock, to a million dollars, four points on the underwriting of $25 million worth of bonds that never should have been underwritten. There are infinite variations on these themes, and as the techniques and circumstances grow more complex, the rights and wrongs of the question become harder to establish. For example, let us try to consider a few of the moral and legal problems of the specialist on the floor of an exchange. The Board of Governors, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and others have been considering them for years now. However, there are some ethical complexities here that would baffle an investigating committee headed by Socrates and St. Thomas Aquinas. The involvements concern what a specialist must and must not do, and when he must and must not do it. The specialist, as you know, is the man who keeps the book in a stock. On the left-hand page of his book, he enters the buy orders that are placed with him, and on the right-hand page, the sell orders. Whenever the orders of a buyer and a seller come together, he executes the transaction and collects a commission for doing it. This part of his duties is quite all right, and perhaps a machine could be invented to do the same thing. But the specialist also steps in sometimes and buys or sells for his own account, risking his own money. Everyone agrees that he has to do this when it is necessary. If he didn't, many of the executions would be shocking. They would be sometimes points away from the last sale. Thus the effort has been to formulate fair rules which would show when his action was necessary and when it was larcenous. The result has been a discouraging welter of legislation, hard to understand and harder to apply. Many specialists feel that what the verbiage actually boils down to is this. The specialist is expected to use his own orders to help maintain an orderly market. But, while performing this public benefaction, he is told, in effect, to be mighty careful that he doesn't make much money for himself. There will be no objection if he loses much money for himself. I have before me an extreme sample of a specialist's problems. It is a sober account of a dramatic occurrence, much more dramatic than the usual dilemmas of a specialist, of October 19, 1937. The opening of the exchange on that day was one of those terrible things which, because of careful regulation, we are not supposed to have any more. At the opening bell, prices were slaughtered and all sorts of incredible things happened, but one of the price transactions seems to have been executed by the specialist in Nash Kelvinator stock. He bid $5 a share, though on the previous day the stock had sold at an average of 11. He bought 8,300 shares at the opening transaction at 5 and did not re-offer any stock in the market for 23 minutes, although in part of that time the market had rallied strongly. He probably made his first sales around 8, and the next day the stock was back where it had been the previous day, at 11. For these interesting activities, the Board of Governors of the New York Stock Exchange suspended him for three months. This gives rise, in order, to the following four thoughts. 1. My goodness, such goings-on turn the rascal out. 2. So they suspended him for 90 days, did they? That seems to have been a Daniel come to judgment. A man who has made $30,000 or more, most of it in 23 minutes, would naturally like to take the wife and kiddies somewhere for three months, rest up and spend some of it. Three, but just what did they punish him for? For only bidding five dollars? Things looked frightful at ten o'clock that morning. Would the Board of Governors have bid six dollars? Would they even have bid four? Would the SEC have bid three? Would you, dear listener, even have bid one? You only had a very short time to make up your mind, and incidentally, did you happen to have $8,300 in October 1937? 
Or perhaps the emphasis in the accusation was placed upon the fact that he failed to re-offer the stock for 23 minutes in a rising market. This may be a sounder accusation, although 23 minutes hardly seems an excessively long time to hold on to a purchase. This writer is unable to arrive at any real sensible judgment on this point. The only standard of criticism we seem to have is that he made too much money for so short a time. We may conclude loosely that the punishment fitted the crime. 4. If at any time during the next fateful 23 minutes the market had broken further and Nash Kelvinator stock had sold down to $2 a share, would anyone have thought of punishing him for losing $30,000. Horizons and Limits of Regulation All reform, as Lincoln Steffers has brilliantly demonstrated, is in at least some respect disappointing. I recall a needed bit of effective moral uplift that the stock exchange authorities themselves successfully enacted before the SEC was established. They put an end, once and for all, to the ancient envelope racket. This was a system of unofficial rebates or of small-time bribery, whichever way you cared to regard it. Certain employees have in their jurisdiction the handing out of commission business to other brokers. They are supposed to decide these allotments on the basis of efficient service. Some of them, from time immemorial, had decided on the basis of the envelope, which was a plain envelope with cash in it. These envelopes were more or less surreptitiously handed out to them each week by the firms that got the business. The stock exchange decided to remove this moat from its own eye and proceeded to do so with complete effectiveness. The reform was in every way a necessary one, but even at that it was still possible for an intimate spectator to observe some social consequences which could be regretted. It was a bad year, and most of the employees in question were getting meager salaries outside of this petty larceny. The envelopes contained cash, and the clerks who received them could, if they were so minded, use the cash to get the children's teeth fixed. But with envelopes taboo, entertainment took their place. At that period, the only way to entertain an order clerk was to take him on a tour of the West Forties, which kept both entertainer and entertainee up all night. Indeed, no entertainment was considered to have tapped the fullest of bonhomie until one or the other of the celebrants had lapsed into delicious unconsciousness in the ultimate taxicab. The money that was not received for the kitty's teeth eventually had to be expended anyway to lash down Papa's kidneys to keep them from floating away. The purposes of the SEC are much broader and more important than such small matters as that. Although the official dedication is stated differently, the commission was called into being by an angry populace. This populace was extremely sore, and it wanted something to be done to prevent so many of our citizens from losing so much of their money in Wall Street. There have always been other agencies more or less fitfully trying to prevent our citizens from losing their money in other fields, such as the racetrack, the crap table, gold bricks, real estate, and their own unsuccessful commercial ventures. It is all part of a human, decent impulse, which is pretty hopeless. It is an effort to put a little truth into the falsest text in the language. God tempereth the wind to the shorn lamb. He doesn't, you know. Look about you. I do not believe that the majority of Wall Streeters, if they actually were presented with the chance, would wish to see a return of the good old bad old days. This majority, which have consciences, just like you have, believe it or not, are screaming like souls in purgatory. But I think what they are screaming about is the way the details of reform work out, rather than the initial principle. It is a long, involved subject. I am only making an effort here by touching on a few of many matters to point up some of the discrepancies between what is hopefully planned, and perhaps occasionally insincerely planned, and what happens. It is hard to get a proper critique of the SEC. My view, for instance, must be somewhat biased because I have been, and still am, connected with Wall Street. But the view of someone from the Corn Belt is not going to be very useful either. I have at times fancied that I detected in the SEC a spirit of gleeful vengeance, which should not be the attitude of a regulatory body. A police force is supposed to keep a city orderly. Destroying the city is not among its duties. 
It has been a long time now since I have observed an honest broker stealing his customary eighth, or a banker his customary million. This is the result of splendid work, and it is high time the country had an authorized body capable of accomplishing such work. But I find myself wishing that the Commission would perform its functions with a little less zip and hurrah. Could they not model their procedure and publicity a little closer to that of the Department of Weights and Measures, and a little less to that of the G-men looking for a public enemy? Perhaps the most important work of the Commission has been the minute scrutiny of new issues. Nothing could be fairer than this needed reform, and it has been carried out to the letter. Wall Streeters felt that such scrutiny would make underwriting too difficult. But the Commission felt that the public deserved to know every last detail of a new bond or stock issue. The Commission has had its way for some years now. What has happened? Well, nothing very much. In 1936-37, there was a boom on. The carefully scrutinized new issues went like hotcakes, and Wall Street's fears proved ungrounded. Then came the recession, and down went everything, just as in the old unregenerate days. After that bull market ended, some of the scrutinized new issues set modest records for the amount of money an investor could lose within a few weeks after subscribing to the issue. In this connection, there is a minor point of some interest. In the days before the SEC, the description of a new issue commonly consisted of a couple of pages, containing an inadequate balance sheet, a skimpy indication of recent earnings, and perhaps a little pep talk. This leaflet didn't begin to contain the things that an investor should know, but it did have one tremendous advantage. An investor could be persuaded to read it. Nowadays, a properly registered prospectus contains everything. It is as long as this book, and duller. Just looking at it causes the intellect to shrink up into a ball of protest. I imagine the same number of people have read one of those things through as have read and finished Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. The Securities and Exchange Commission has long bent its efforts toward the maintenance of an orderly market. This is praiseworthy, but they haven't achieved much in that direction. Only the dull markets have been orderly. I imagine that the Maritime Commission would like to maintain an orderly ocean. But when the heavens split... And the lightnings crack. One commission is about as effective as the other, so far as maintaining orderliness is concerned. The SEC has not been loath to join the popular hue and cry against the friendless short seller. From this, we have a right to deduce that they not only want an orderly market, but a market which shall forever gently rise. Of course, that conception is just plain silly, like Voltaire's suggestion that a community ought to be able to support itself by everybody taking in everybody else's washing. I have no doubt at all that the commissioners understand what makes sense and what doesn't, at least as well as I do. But the majority of the public does not, and the commission represents the public from whom, in the last analysis, it receives its mandate. My suspicion is that the commissioners sometimes strive to please their public with regulations that they can't have much faith in themselves. It is humanly asking too much of them to say to the public, "Now just stop fretting yourselves about some of these things you don't quite understand." Indeed, one of the chief points on the agenda of the SEC has been to work toward the ideal of a completely informed investing public. This effort is in every way laudable, and progress, though necessarily slow, should be assured. However, just as a fanciful exercise in paradox, let us consider what would happen if, on some miraculous dawn, the entire investing public woke up to find itself completely informed. That would certainly be the end of an orderly market, for a panic, either bull. Or bear would ensue. Everybody would know whether to buy or sell, and whichever it was, everybody would be trying to do the same thing at once, and there would be no one to complete the other side of the trade. Orderly markets, like horse races, exist on differences of opinion. Wall Street needed the SEC just as baseball after 1919 needed Commissioner Landis. But people who are interested in baseball are more realistic than people interested in Wall Street. The fans did not expect that Judge Landis would do more for the game than keep it reasonably honest. They did not expect him to improve the quality of the fielding and hitting. 
Nevertheless, a considerable part of the public seems to be expecting that the SEC will make speculation and investment safer. These hopeful individuals are reminiscent of the benevolent soul who said at the beginning of the poker game, Now, boys, if we all play carefully, we can all win a little. In Conclusions The customary construction of a didactic book is for the author first to explain, as realistically as he can, the circumstances and problems of his subject. Then, at the end, there is a section, something like the answers in an algebra book, entitled A Constructive Program, or Wither Wither. The interested reader can scarcely wait to get to this section, which will settle once and for all what the administration should do next, or what is the good life. The notion, a debatable one, is that the man who knows the problems necessarily knows the answers. This book has not been successful if it has not suggested some big league problems, such as, one, should our financial machinery be scrapped? Two, should it be further tinkered with, and if so, how much further? Three, is capitalism doomed? Four, what active stock selling under five dollars looks hot just now for a quick turn to pay for the Buick the wife just bought? There isn't an assistant instructor in economics in any faculty who can't answer these and similar questions rapidly and categorically, and if that is not enough, there are a million laymen eager to do so. So, I don't feel that my vote is much needed. For the record, and if anyone cares, I will state that I have a sneaking fondness for that wretched old hag, the capitalistic system, after watching the performance of her temperamental younger rivals. I believe we had better preserve our financial machinery, even with much of the nonsense still adhering to it. The way we have been brought up, we all have a fondness for articles which can only be made in plants costing millions of dollars. Few of these articles can be produced by a fellow and his uncle working behind the garage. The only successful method so far devised for getting millions out of the public for enterprises both good and bad is some system similar to the devious mechanisms of Wall Street. Money has occasionally been raised from the public by smacking the citizens with the broad side of a saber, but the results of this were always less than satisfactory. On problem number two, I do not choose to commit myself with any lucidity, but I am willing to submit an idea to the Securities and Exchange Commission that perhaps they have thought of themselves, they are in the position of a doctor who has only one patient with no prospect of ever getting another, it would be a tactical error to kill this patient, even though a commendable scientific zeal prompts the doctor to try out his whole shelf of pharmacopoeia on him. After all, there is no real danger in this case of the patient ever becoming completely cured. The answer to problem number four is being withheld for our special five-star flash. Merely clip and fill out the coupon and close two dollars, and the name of this stock will be sent to you in a plain envelope. In conclusion, I must remind you that I work in Wall Street and assure you that my organization is, of course, quite different from anything I have described here. Perhaps what you are looking for is a long-range comprehensive investment program, conservative yet liberal, which will protect you from the effects of inflation and also deflation, and which will allow you to sleep nights. In this case, just stop in at my office and let us recommend a program. I will see to it personally that your inquiries are referred to the head of our crystal-gazing department. This has been an Audible Incorporated production of where Are the Customers' Yachts? or A Good Hard Look at Wall Street Written by Fred Schwed Jr. Narrated by Mark Mosley Producer Mike Charzik Copyright 1940, 1955, 1995, 2006 by Fred Schwed Production Copyright 2012 by Audible Incorporated Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.